Um, but good evening and thank you for joining us on behalf of the Canadian Remedial Action Plan Implement Implementation Committee. It's a pleasure to have you joining us for our fifth science symposium. Due to the pandemic, we have turned the 2021 symposium into a virtual series of three information sessions. Tonight is our first session in the series and it will provide an overview of the measures that are in place, that are in place to safeguard drinking water taken from the St. Clair River. The Canadian Remedial Action Plan Committee, or CRIC for short, is a committee that is dedicated to the restoration of the St. Clair River's aquatic environment. The CRIC has many members, including government agencies, industry, conservation organizations, non-government organizations, Amjanon First Nation, and Walpole Island First Nation. My name is April White, and I'm the co-chair of the CRIC, along with Ted Briggs. I work for the federal government, of Environment and Climate Change Canada, and Ted works for the provincial government at the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks. For this evening, we have two presentations. The first will be a short overview by myself of the environmental challenges of the river and how the creek is addressing them and our progress. Our key presentation will be given by Natasha Bonzega, who is our local remedial action plan coordinator for the St. Clair River. Following the presentation by Natasha, we'll have a question and answer period. And to help field questions, we are very lucky to have with us tonight uh, several panelists. George, uh, sorry, Din Scanier, who is the general manager of the Blue Water Association, Association for Safety, Environment and Sustainability, or BASIS for short. Darren Galbraith, who is the director of operations, water and wastewater for the municipality of Chatham-Kent and Chris Lee, who is the chair of the Wallsburg Advisory Team for a Cleaner Habitat, or WATCH for short. Before we kick off our event with an opening prayer, I uh, want to just cover a few housekeeping items. We are using a Zoom webinar platform. As you can see, it's uh, not free from its technical challenges, particularly by uh, folks who may not be used to the platform, including myself. So as a participant, you do not have audio or video capability, which saves on bandwidth and will reduce some background noises. This means that to ask a question, you can simply click on your Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Click on that icon and a text box will open and you can simply type your question. You can type your questions throughout the evening. Uh, and you can keep them coming. They, you do not have to assign your name, and I will not be reading uh, names that, um, of people that ask questions. So don't feel shy, pipe in, ask away. We are here to share, listen, and learn. So all questions, of course, are welcome. We uh, will answer, we'll endeavor to answer as many questions as we can tonight, and those that we don't get to, we will, um, uh, provide an, a written response and publish that on our AOC website. We apologize in advance for not getting to your question. We've also incorporated two short polls to conduct during the evening and encourage your participation in these calls, polls. A follow-up survey will be emailed to you tomorrow to solicit feedback on the event. This will help us improve our future sessions. And they've been designed to take only uh, like a minute or less. This event is going to be recorded and will be available on the AOC website as well. I want to thank the organizers of this event, certainly our panelists, our technical support team tonight, um, all of which have made this event possible. I'm now very pleased to welcome Lynn Rosales from Amgenon First Nation, who will say an opening prayer and share some knowledge about Navy water. Lynn, over to you. Uh, bonjour, everyone. Uh, uh, bonjour, and we are going to talk on a pro quen, just in a case, my condo rem, Jabob or water me down, I'm John Dunchpa, uh, Niso Mdeo, uh, Nimi Gwetch Windham, and come to Scott, me Gwetch Gemini Rope, and I'm a bad swim, me Gwetch Scott, me que, uh, Minobamad's wind, mean my, uh, and to uh, 
say miigwech to uh, the organizers for reaching out to me to be a part of this uh, opening for your meeting this evening. Um, I just did a short brief introduction of myself in the language, um, my, my Anishinaabe name, uh, my clan, uh, my spirit name is uh, Fire in the Clouds Woman, I'm from the Bear Clan. I, uh, I, was, I was born here in uh, Amjanong, this is my, this is my home. Uh, I've had the privilege of living here part of my life and then living the other part of my life uh, across the creek in the States. Uh, so I've lived in both countries uh, uh, and been able to uh, witness and learn many different things from uh, many different places and different people in my life. I'm uh, really grateful to, to be here this day and um, <clears throat> I, I was told that everyone was going to uh, have have some nibe, uh, the water, and a little uh, glass. So I'm going to. Um, I already uh, lit some smudge, and uh, I was holding some tobacco, and I just uh, I said uh, I just. Thank Creator for this for this day. Um, our, our mother, our, our mother, hey, the, our mother Earth, who uh, provides everything that we need to live. And most importantly, one of the one of the key elements that all of creation needs to survive and uh, and live is uh, to have good that good clean water. You know, um, and from the teachings and things that I've learned through time is that, you know, that, that, uh, that water is alive. Water has a spirit. Water um, flows in us and through us. And we rely on having that good, clean water to... Um, to make it through our days and it's a huge part of our life and somewhere through time uh, we've forgotten about the spirituality that uh, all of creation holds and when we can reconnect and really fully accept the spirituality of water and the spirituality of life, uh, it helps to fill us, eh? fills our heart, fills our heart with, um, with, with love, right? And to, uh, to, to embrace those things, when we bring those things into our life, um, it helps us to not only further understand ourselves as part of creation, but also to have that respect for for um for all of creation right so i'm going to um i'm uh i'm gonna take my earphones off okay can can everyone still hear me okay yes we can hear you okay so i'm going i'm going to um i'm just gonna I'm gonna sing uh, a little water song. And um, so while I'm singing my song, I'm gonna invite each and every one of you, especially Equewa, uh, all you women who are on the call, you know, to say that prayer for that water and, and give thanks for, for the life that it brings to us, okay? Um, and I know there's some men on the call too, um, I, and, and you can say your own prayer in your own way, but I know uh, for women, this is our responsibility as Anishinaabe Kwe, as Jaganash uh, Kwe, um, you know, it's our responsibility to take care of this, uh, this water, um, not only for ourselves, but uh, for our family and, and for our, for our menfolk who walk in our, with us, you know, in our lives. 
So you can uh, say your prayer in your own way. And um, I'm just going to sing a little song here. <clears throat> to have have sips of your uh, your nibin now um, and enjoy enjoy that because as we know um, as we know uh, when when uh, we sing for our water and we pray over our water we in essence it then becomes like um, it, it's uh, it's renewed it you know we're, we're praying for that and we're praying for that water to uh to bring to bring all that good back um um in in into our own life and into our physical being so that um it will go to those places in our body that that it is needed so i want to say um miigwech for for allowing me to open your session in this way and um and uh, I look forward to hearing your presentation. Miigwech. Oh, Miigwech, thank you, Lynn, for the prayer. So let's begin. As you all know, there's a very long industrial history in the Sarnia, Sarnia area as a result of the discovery of oil in the late 1800s. This led to significant industrial and municipal development which impacted water quality and the aquatic environment of the St. Clair River. Issues included sediment contamination, accumulation of contaminants in fish and wildlife, fish consumption and fire advisories, beach closings, and loss of fish wildlife habitat. In 1987, Canada and the U.S. identified the St. Clair River as an area of concern, along with 42 other sites around the Great Lakes. An AOC is a geographic area where there has been significant environmental degradation. Um, due to human activities within that geographic area. Of the 43 AOCs identified by Canada and the US, 
12 are wholly located in Canada and five are binational, meaning they are of a shared responsibility between Canada and the US. The St. Clair River is one of these five shared binational AOCs. The remaining 26 AOCs are fully located in the US. Of the 17 AOCs Canada has been working on, three have been removed from the list of AOCs of great, around the Great Lakes as their environmental issues have been addressed, and two AOCs are in recovery, meaning all the necessary restoration actions have been complete and monitoring is underway to ensure the restoration targets are met. Once they're achieved, these areas can also be removed from the list of AOCs around the Great Lakes. This is a process commonly referred to as the listing. In the remaining AEOCs, including the St. Clair River, restoration efforts continue. And you can see there's the map of all AOCs around the Great Lakes. So you may be wondering what specific problems were evaluated in the process of identifying uh, all of these areas of concern, or AOCs for short. The answer is 14. There are 14 specific criteria or beneficial use impairments, or BUIs for short, that were evaluated in each AOC. And all AOCs have one or more of these 14 problems you see in the blue box. As you can see, these problems range from tainted fish flavor, to beach closings, to degraded fish and wildlife populations, and loss of fish and wildlife habitat. Each BUI is evaluated and given a status of either impaired, meaning they do not meet specific quality objectives or not impaired. In instances where there is insufficient data to make a determination of impaired or not impaired, the BUI or the issue, the challenge, was deemed to require further assessment. A BUI could remain requires further assessment until there was sufficient data to make a determination of impaired or not. Impaired BUIs have restoration criteria that must be met uh, in order for the designation to change to a not impaired status. These criteria are specific, measurable, and aim to address the original cause of the impairment, meaning the early days of industrialization and urbanization in these areas. The restoration criteria have been carefully and collaboratively developed by members of the CRIC, that is the Canadian Remedial Action Plan Implementation Committee, not the government. It's also the CRIC that makes the recommendation to change the status of a BUI that is impaired or RFA to a not impaired status. It truly is a collaborative approach. For the St. Clair River, the evaluation of 14 BUIs was completed in 1991 and all but two required attention. Many, as you can see from this chart, were impaired and some required further assessment. As indicated in the chart, there's been significant progress between then and now, as many BUIs have been restored to a not impaired status. Again, this occurs when locally developed restoration goals have been successfully met. The asterisk beside BUI4 regarding fish tumors indicates that the CRIC has recommended a not impaired status for this BUI but it, has, but it has not officially changed. Once all BUIs are redesignated to a not impaired status, the St. Clair River can be removed from the list of AOCs, and this is the goal of the CRIC. The focus of tonight's discussion is really around BUI 9, restrictions of uh, drinking water or taste and odor problems. This will be Natasha's uh, presentation following mine. This was a BUI that was deemed impaired due to frequent spills to the river and the closure of the water intakes downstream. Here's the map of the Canadian side of the St. Clair River AOC. It is a binational AOC, so there is uh, uh, an equivalent boundary on the US side. On the Canadian side, it extends from the Blue Water Bridge down to Mitchell's Bay. So you may be wondering how BUIs get restored and who coordinates and implements the necessary actions to make that happen. Well, the restoration of AOCs is guided by a remedial action plan or a RAP for short. 
A wrap is a cleanup plan. It's aimed to address the impaired BUIs and determine the status of BUIs that require for their assessment. The goal of the wrap is to address the historical impacts of a degraded environment. They do not address contemporary issues such as invasive species, climate change, or other more current issues, as the RAP is really intended to address environmental problems that resulted from early days of industrialization and urbanization in these areas. The RAP was created by the CRIC, that's the Local Canadian Remedial Action Plan Implementation Committee, and as you can appreciate, the implementation of a wrap to restore impaired BYs is a team effort. And here is the team. As you can see, the CRIC is a large and diverse committee that has representation from all levels of government, all various agencies with a connection to the environment, industry, conservation organizations, the public, Amazonian First Nation, as well as Wolfpool Island First Nation. The CRIC members bring their expertise, knowledge, funding, and time in order to implement the necessary actions to restore the impairments of the river. The goal of the RAP is to remove the impaired BUIs and delist the AOC. Um, once the AOC is delisted, it means it is of a consistent quality uh, found elsewhere around the Great Lakes. After, the, after working together for 30 years, we have made some improvements and there's more to do, but some of our accomplishments include municipal uh, infrastructure uh, upgrades. There's been a significant financial investment to do this. This has improved the aesthetic and the water quality, removing bacteria and unsightly uh, slicks and debris that were once common in the river. There's been various fish and wildlife studies that have been completed to assess fish and wildlife related beneficial use impairments. There's been numerous fish and wildlife habitat creation and improvement projects within the AOC. In fact, over 280 projects have been completed and they have resulted in over 250 hectares of habitat. Additionally, 12 shoreline restoration projects along the river to naturalize the river um, have also been completed. This reduces erosion as well as providing aquatic habitat to fish and aquatic animals. There's also been monitoring of uh, fish and wetland habitat quality, and this provides valuable information to assess change over time. Contaminated sediment has been removed, and in the early 2000s, and field work has been completed um, to facilitate the planning and management of the remaining contaminated sediments in the river. There's been uh, a lot of success, and as I said, there's more to do, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to our RAP coordinator, Natasha, to talk about the progress made to safeguard drinking water in the AOC through legislative and voluntary measures. But before Natasha gets started, uh, we're going to launch our first poll. All right, so I guess it's on to me then. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Natasha Pazega and as April mentioned, I'm the Remedial Action Plan Coordinator for the St. Clair River Area of Concern. Um, I'm based out of the St. Clair Region Conservation Authority um, and simply put, my job is to act as a liaison between all of our program partners, including federal and provincial governments, uh, Amjanong and Walpole Island First Nations, industry and the general public. and do my best to keep everyone informed on progress of the Remedial Action Plan. Sorry, I should check, can you hear me? Yes. All oh, good. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. So I do my best to keep everyone informed on the progress of the Remedial Action Plan. Uh, I answer questions when I can. Now, I can't answer those questions. I try to direct them to the individual or, or group who can best answer them for you. Uh, so that's why I'm here today. I'm providing a brief update on the restrictions to drinking water or taste and odor problems, beneficial use impairment. Um, and I would like to point out that I am not an expert on this topic. So I'll only be providing an overview and I'll share how we're moving this beneficial use impairment forward. But we've asked three experts to join us today who are much more knowledgeable about the topic. Um, so you can answer, you can ask them your questions directly uh, using the Q&A box. So as previously stated, uh, we're talking about the impairments to drinking water consumption today. Um, back in the late 80s and early 90s, industrial spills were common in the St. Clair River, which ultimately led to the designation of the St. Clair River as an area of concern and the development of the Remedial Action Plan. 
uh, drinking water drawn from the St. Clair River is a beneficial use or a human enjoyment um, that's been deemed impaired due to these frequent industrial spills to the river. Um, these spills have resulted in you know, uh, taste and odor problems in the water, and in some cases uh, it, they've caused the closure of water treatment plants, um, interrupting the supply of drinking water to the community and ultimately impacting the quality of life of those residents. Um, oh, pardon me, sorry, that's it too quickly. Um, in the Ontario portion of the area of concern, there are two communities and a handful of private intakes that draw raw water from the St. Clair River downstream of the Sarnia Industrialized Zone as a drinking water supply. These impacted communities include Walpole Island First Nation and Wallaceburg. Other communities within the area of concern, such as Point Edward, Sarnia and Mitchells Bay, source their drinking water supply from either Lake Huron or Lake Erie, so they're not necessarily impacted by the spills of the St. Clair River and are therefore outside of the scope of this beneficial use assessment. However, I do want to point out that uh, many of the actions that have been adopted here to protect the St. Clair River are not unique to this area and are also being impl implemented across the Great Lakes and Ontario. When areas of concern were first identified and remedial action plans were developed, it was decided that the delisting criteria or the goals that needed to be met in order to uh, for this beneficial use to be deemed restored or unimpaired was that there would be no treatment plant shutdowns due to exceedances of drinking water guidelines over a two-year period. Those criteria remain today. They were re-evaluated by a subcommittee of the Canadian RAP Implementation Committee between 2010 and 2012. Um, this review stemmed from concerns that the delisting criteria weren't robust enough um, for something as complex as the, our drinking water impairment. But after thorough consideration, that committee was unable to improve the criteria and they actually didn't propose any significant changes to them. They recognized the sensitivity and complexity of this impairment, as well as the inability to completely remove human error. So they felt it was more realistic um, that it was it wasn't realistic to realistic to expect that all spills would be eliminated. And instead they thought that greatly reducing risks, sources and causes of spills would be more achievable and therefore considered a more practical approach to safeguarding the drinking water supply. Subsequently, um, the CRIC decided that any future assessments for this beneficial use impairment would consider both the period during which no intakes were closed due to spills, as well in as, as an assessment of the risk management factors that are considered when most important um, that are considered most important in addressing the causes of the impairment. So those included spill prevention and contingency initiatives implemented at facilities adjacent to the river, the effectiveness of spill warning system, all related systemic improvements that could be legislative, regulatory, uh, or compliance-based contributing to the reductions in the risk of spills and the frequency of spills over time resulting in those um, water intake closures. So those topics have really been the foundation for the multi-barrier approach adopted for addressing this BUI. Um, if we can't completely eliminate spills, at least we can uh, put barriers in place to greatly reduce the risk of spills. And in the unfortunate event that a spill does occur, there's an emergency response plan to minimize impacts downstream. So we can take a look at each of these barriers a little bit further. So the first one was um, spill prevention. So you'll see a list here of, of some of um, some of the items that we're using for spill prevention. So uh, we have enforced regulations and penalties. Um, in the early 2000s, we saw some key pieces of legislation come into force, such as the Ontario Safe Drinking Water Act and the Ontario Clean Water Act, which help protect drinking water systems and human health. We also have Bill 133, the Environmental Enforcement Statute Law Amendment Act, which expanded the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks powers to deal with industrial polluters. And it expanded on the provisions in the Environmental Protection Act that require directors and officers of corporations to take all reasonable care to prevent the corporation from causing or permitting the discharge of a contaminant into the natural environment. We also have uh, spills prevention and contingency plans regulations. Um, so that means that any facility with a discharge offsite is required to have a spills prevention contingency plan, um, and they're required to update those annually or uh, following any incidents. We also have environmental compliance approvals for wastewater discharges. Um, these set strict limits for what companies or municipalities are permitted to discharge to the river. There are monitoring and reporting requirements for wastewater dischargers. 
There is mandatory monitoring of drinking water quality um, at uh, water intakes. We have facility inspections, um, the participation of industry. Um, I mean, it, many of our industrial partners here have voluntarily committed to doing more than legislation requires to protect the environment, which is really great. Um, and then we also have source water protection plans. So the Thames Sydenham Source Water Protection Committee, um, they were established back in 2007, and that involved 25 regional stakeholders putting together a science-based plan to protect source water in the region. So that plan was approved in 2015 and, and is currently being implemented. Our second barrier uh, is our sy systemic improvements, where this includes things like infrastructure upgrades, uh, infrastructure and equipment inspections, monitoring and spill detection and response systems, mandatory spill response plans, uh, enhanced training and certification. So this is really important uh, for water operators who are responsible for treating the water that eventually reaches your taps. We have stronger accountability for directors and companies uh, who, who do have spills. Um, the replacement and enhancement of once through cooling water systems, which had been identified as a big contributor to frequent spills in the past, um, that's super key. And then we also have uh, the Blue Water Association for Safety, Environment and Sustainability, who works with uh, many of the larger industries along the river to make sure proper mechanisms are in place to protect workers, the public and the environment. So again, this is not an exhaustive list, but this shows some of the actions or initiatives that have been implemented as systemic barriers at the ground level. Um, our third barrier was warning and notification systems. So these can also greatly reduce the risk of impacts to the drinking water supply, um, knowing what's happening upstream and, and being able to prepare for it downstream is very important. Um, so as we mentioned, each company is required to have their own spills and emergency response plan, uh, which includes the requirement to notify the spills action center and the local municipality. Um, the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks also has models that they've created to predict where and how quickly spilled substances will move through the St. Clair River. And I just want to point out that all spills to land, air or water are required to be reported to the Spills Action Centre. Um, so that's a part of the Ministry of Ontario Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Um, and they will dictate how the, how the spill is responded to. Um, but they also provide notification to um, owners and operators of downstream drinking water intakes, local health agencies, First Nation communities, and other federal and provincial agencies as required. Um, upon notification that a spill has occurred, municipalities also have their own emergency response systems and can dispatch emergency services as necessary. Uh, or in a, you know, a really terrible emergency, they could uh, release orders directly to the public um, for, uh, you know, to take shelter or, or other things. Um, given that the St. Clair River is a binational river, there's also a notification, um, also notification provided to our neighbors in the US. So I just wanna show um, this graphic here. Uh, back in 2017, the Can Canadian RAP Implementation Committee commissioned a discussion paper to be written to review facts related to spills frequency over time, uh, identify infrastructure improvements related to drinking water sources, and to promote thought and discussion among the public, First Nations, stakeholders, and agencies on several questions, including comfort with the current delisting criteria. So I borrowed this graphic from that report to show you how the number of spills causing these water intake closures has greatly reduced over time, and that those years coincide with the impl implementation of some of these preventative and systemic initiatives to prevent spills to the river. Um, following the completion of that report, the Wallace Burke Advisory Team for a Cleaner Habitat, commonly known as WATCH, took charge in conducting a voluntary survey of industry, and they interviewed six major dischargers in the Sarnia area at their facilities to provide a comprehensive assessment of the spill prevention um, at each company's site. And, and what procedures and technologies they have in place. So one of our panelists this evening is Chris Lee, who helped spearhead that survey and ensure that those results were made available to the public. Um, so both of these reports suggested it would be appropriate to move forward uh, with reassessing the status of the drinking water beneficial use. So that leads us to where we are today. Um, currently, a draft assessment report is being developed and will recommend that restrictions on drinking water and taste and odor problems um, should be considered um, unimpaired for the St. Clair River. 
Um, once the draft report is written, it will enter a formal redesignation process, which starts with a presentation to and review review by the, the CRIC. Um, and if, if they approve, then the report would then enter a public and First Nations engagement period where we would collect comments and questions from the greater community on the report. Um, there are more steps to that process. I haven't included them because they are still a ways away, um, but I, I just wanted to point out that um, getting your feedback on that draft assessment report once it is written uh, is really important. So, so keep, keep an eye out for that. Um, I also wanted to mention that in um, our partners in the US, um, we, we try to coordinate with them as often as possible on the redesignation of some of these BUIs. And at this time, they are also preparing a draft assessment report for this beneficial use impairment. Um, any of these publics, or sorry, any of these reports are public. Um, they are posted on Friends of St. Clair.ca, so you're welcome to, to look there for these reports. And if you're having any problems, you're welcome to email me directly, and I'm happy to provide them to you. Um, this is a really complex topic, uh, and it's a really important topic. And I've really only scratched the surface, but I wanted to leave as much time as possible for you today uh, to be able to ask your questions directly to tonight's panelists, because I think that's where you'll really get the most value rather than listening to me blab on. Um, so thank you so much for listening, and I'll pass it back to April to introduce our panelists uh, for the evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Natasha. Can everybody hear me? I hope I'm unmuted. So now we've come to the uh, time in the agenda where we are open for questions. And as I said, um, kindly use, here, there is the slide. Uh, what you should see is a participant. So um, there is a chat and a Q&A feature. And it's easier for us to manage the questions through a Q&A, but we are monitoring both. So um, you can feel free to type your question in uh, using either tool and we can uh, open up the panelists. As I said, we have three, we have several actually. So the, the Canadian um, RAP Implementation Committee is really a team effort. And so we have a lot of, um, representatives um, from different organizations that are, are that have water expertise that are here tonight. And um, so we're gonna be drawing upon them to field some questions, but specifically we have with us, as I said, Vince uh, Gagne, who is the, um, who works for BASIS. We also have um, Darren Galbraith, who is with the Chatham-Kent um, Water and Wastewater uh, treatment or public utilities, and we have Chris Lee, who's um, the chair of WATCH. So we do have questions coming in. I think we'll just get started, and hopefully our panelists are unmuted, and maybe we can spotlight them. Uh, this one is for um, Chris, if you can briefly just Describe the role of watch. Um, yes, I, I think from Natasha's presentation, um, our focus on watch was the systemic part of the system. Uh, what watch uh, was interested in is uh, the community right to know in terms of pre the technology that prevents offsite discharges, effluents. And uh, we ran into a little bit of a problem there because um, there is no mandate or authority for the Ministry of the Environment to approach these industries to say uh, the downriver uh, communities want to know what sort of technology you have in place to prevent a spill. Um, you know, we can't go to Industry X and say, Industry X, give us your technology and what do you do? And one of the arguments for that as to why they, they don't normally do that is because supposedly if you, if the industry gives you their uh, pollution prevention, spill prevention technology, somehow or other, somebody very smart can work backwards and figure out their secret sauce. And so that was the reason that we were given. So um, the ministry was unable to help us uh, to, to uh, give us that information. And we said, fine. <laughs> we kind of said, well, fine, we'll just do it without you. So that's exactly what we did. Um, we're fortunate because I believe that WATCH um, 
has has a long reputation of working constructively with the industries in Sarnia. Uh, and the industries in Sarnia have in the past been quite cooperative in terms of in terms of the information when we asked for it. And so we approached each of the the main direct dischargers that the ministry wasn't able to go to and help. And we asked for interviews with each of them. Um, there were four of us, I believe there, and as some of the people are on this, this call, there was Bella and Sheldon and Jim and myself. And the four of us went to these industries one-on-one -on -one, face to face meetings. And we asked them very pertinent questions about their spill prevention offsite technology. And then we made notes, we sent the notes to back to the company and we said, is there anything in here that is going to give you proprietary, you know, I call it the secret sauce information. And they all agreed that no, there was nothing there, that it was accurate. And then we posted that information, which you can now find on biowatch.ca. And okay. uh, then so I'm hoping that that is going to be able to be used for the ministry in this report. Thanks, Chris. That's great. The next one is for uh, Vince. Vince, can you explain uh, what BASES, B-A-S-E-S, -E is about? Sure. Uh, it's, uh, can, can you hear me there? Yeah. All right, great. So um, BASES actually is, uh, is a brand for three uh, existing associations. So you have um, Sarnia Lampton Environmental Association, you have Sarnia Lampton Community Awareness and Emergency Response, and you have Sarnia Lampton Industrial Educational Co-op. This model of, the, of collaboration through these uh, regional associations has been going on, I think, since 1953, 54, a long time. It's, it's almost 70 years. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's uh, something how the three organizations all worked independent of each other, but the more that they did, the more you could, they, they started to come together. So it's, it's um, think of it as an HSC model of uh, sort of more of a sustainability or responsible care kind of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a lens that we have health, safety, and environment where you have the IEC, SLE, and CARE now all functioning under one brand called BASES. So the other, the other benefit of that, uh, of course, is that now we've got a new website uh, where all three of those groups exist. So if you're from away or if, you're, if you want to learn more about the area in terms of health, safety, and environment, you can go to a one-stop shop. It's the uh, it's lamptonbases.ca, uh, Canadian. And uh, you can go there and you can see where there's uh, lots of good information about the three organizations, about our boards, who sits on our boards, our committees, the work of our committees, and different tools that we have going on there. The, the one thing I will highlight that we're really excited about is that the, 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 one of the showcase things of this, of this move is how we're working with industry to get notifications uh, coming directly from industry to the community. Uh, the words that I heard loud and clear from uh, the Blue Water Community Advisory Panel was put the CA back in care. And, and, and so listening to that and following that direction were we're, we're creating a tool on basis where industry can put notifications directly out to the public. And this isn't just for emergency situations, it's for non-emergency situations that the that industry feels that the public would like to know about. And that could be a flare, that could be noise, that could be uh, maybe a traffic uh, it, uh, road closure. So anyway, it's just opening up the lines of communication. So. If there's one thing that BASES is trying to do uh, is, uh, is, is to improve the transparency and the lines of communication with the public. That's great, thank you. Yes. The next one is for Darren. Uh, Darren, can you just comment on um, kind of water intake closures over the last couple of years? How many have occurred, if any? Uh, okay. Um, we have not had any closures to the Wallsburg intake since 2013. Um, that one was caused, there was two, sorry. Um, one was caused from a diesel spill. Our intake was closed for about 14 hours. And the other one was a surfactant refinery cleaner that would made us shut down for 26 and a half hours. That was a very lengthy one. And of course our biggest one was in 2012 was a ethyl benzene made us shut down for 41 and a half hours. 
hope that answered the question. Yeah, I think so. Thank you. Um, oh, actually, there's another one for you, Darren. Uh, what type of monitoring is conducted by the water intake facilities? Okay, uh, so Ontario Regulation 170 mandates us to test the raw water for, um, we call it Schedule 23, which are uh, nine elements, and Schedule 24, which is our 44 organic compounds. Uh, nitrates and nitrates are, nitrites and nitrates are done on a weekly basis. Uh, that's mostly to, to look to see if there's any agricultural runoff. And it's also, raw water is also tested for total coliforms and E. coli um, weekly. And then from May to October, we actually test for microcystins that comes from the cyanobacteria. Um, we also have obviously um, turbidity monitors, on, continuous online analyzers, chlorine analyzers, and pH analyzers. The chlorine analyzers are a big indicator to us at the intake to tell us if something was to happen to come into the intake that we were unaware of, uh, because if it's a hydrocarbon, it will uh, consume the free chlorine residual very quickly, and that will give us an, an idea that something has happened. And if it does reach a certain point on our set point for alarming, we'll get called out. And obviously, if it's a dramatic change to chlorine, the intake, it, the, we call them low lift pumps that pull out of the Chanel card, will close. And we'll have to come in and diagnose and see what the problems are and get testing going. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, there's another one. Are both industry and municipal wastewater facilities required to report overflows and emission, emissions to the river whenever there is a storm event? So, uh, Darren, you can take a shot. And Vince, is that something well, you can that's, answer? That's in my wheelhouse, too. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. They're definitely <laughs> mandated in our um, certificate of approvals uh, to um, first, let the uh, Spills Action Center know that we we have that been bypassing. Um, that could be mostly due rain events, um, info and infiltration purposes, combined sewers. Um, but for when a bypass does occur, we to let them know we sample at the beginning of the bypass, we monitor the, how much flow it is, and then when it is completed, we sample it again. And of course, those samples all go off to our labs in Toronto and then everything is, um, paperwork has to be filled out for the, the street environment, uh, conservation and parks. So yep, yes, we definitely are mandated to uh, identify and sample spills. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Vince, there is uh, another one for you. Um, can you provide a few examples of some spill prevention initiatives by industry? So, um if you think about um, if you're uh, proof you're you, you now own uh, a company and you're operating in a, in a petrochemical facility you would it, it was it's a normal process to uh, look at your systems and and try to understand and actually it relates to the to the graph that you had before we put the different layers of protection in place where you you, you try to engineer it out you put in administrative controls and you put so in terms of specific projects, the, the best place to get the information on specific projects would be would be two things. First, I'd read that watch report. It's really good. It's got a nice summary uh, from the from uh, some of the plants up here. But uh, you would contact them directly to get to get a, an idea of specific projects that, that they're that they're working on. But uh, in a, in a in a nutshell, when you look at the process, you look at what are the opportunities for any kind of a failure? And you you then look at how you can engineer it out, how you can look at different pressures. Uh, you can look at preventive maintenance. You, know, you have these big things, these big shutdowns, and they'll shut stuff down, and they will go in and do inspections to for uh, preventive maintenance to see where things are at with the uh, different types of tests they do. Uh, there's, uh, there's different designs where you say, well, if you can't, then if this happens, you'll have a, a, a system that will, that will monitor it through what they call a DCS or a control system. And, and they, will, they will identify if this happens, then they will reroute flows and they will, they will move something. There's a very sophisticated uh, measurement that you can put at these, at these spots that will drive decision logic in the systems. And I guess, of course, the, 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 the one thing that you never want to discount is the training of really good operators. And where they're monitoring the systems, they they know their their units very well, and, and they know how they operate, and they know what's normal and what's not. And when they pick up on if something's not not right, they have the the training and they have the tools to go and do the tests and respond. 
and I'm sure that the story I'm telling is very similar to Darren and your your operators at, at, at your plants that they're 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 trained to to be able to respond to to uh, to something that they see is not is not uh, no is some something that needs investigation and they 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 chase it down and they get answers and, and that's where if there isn't a, a need then they'll they'll trigger uh, all kinds of different uh, options that they have there that we built again all about layers of protection with the final one being final final one being that if it if it goes to the the river then there's reporting that's done and and there's a response that, that's triggered there great thank you Welcome. um uh here's a question for darren when running creek reverses its flow what action is taken for added chlorine being added to the drinking water yeah that, that's a very good question because it does happen usually uh, this time of year when there's no crops on the ground to uh, keep the soil from entering uh, the water course. So yes, so when Running Creek does run the wrong direction, we call it, it does uh, affect our intake because um, the turbidity goes up. When the turbidity goes up, there's usually bacteria and there's different things in the water. Chlorine does really get used up heavily. We have to use more uh, coagulants to reduce the turbidity. So we meet our parameters in the drinking water system. Um, we are looking at, uh, we are actually in a class environmental assessment as we speak, and we are looking at options for that. If we go uh, with the Schnelli cart water, a uh, different filtration system, which is microfiltration, that would reduce the need for coagulants and, and, and all that. So when you use coagulants, you, you produce a flock, which is a sludge, it's kind of a waste material that has to be dealt with, and that goes to the Wallsburg water, uh, water pollution control plant. And by going to microfiltration, that would eliminate the, the need for the um, extra chlorine and um, coagulant dosages. So a good question. Not, not a lot of people understand about Runny Creek um, going backwards, how the flow in the Schnelli cart goes backwards, but it, it does happen. Great, thank you. Um, this one is for Chris and others who want to comment with almost no water plant closures. Um, in around in several years, based on tonight's graph, has the problem of spills in the river been solved, or is there more to do? It's always about risk of spills. Um, I think there will always touch wood. Uh, there will always be the potential for a spill, and I think right now, uh, because of the what the industries have done with increasing their uh, containment ponds so that if there is a, a, uh, an upset, they're able to close their outfalls, they are able to divert water uh, into containment ponds. Um, there are all kinds of technologies that, you know, even prevent that from happening. So that risk, uh, as, as technology improves, I think that risk from industry has gone down. Uh, where the risks are still is in shipping. Um, we are, we do have chemical tankers. These, these uh, ships run in the winter when there is ice. Um, and uh, so then that's when we um, use uh, the, the modeling for spills. But when you have ice, it's very difficult to predict. So I would say that the risks have gone down, but there will always be a hazard or there will always be um, problems or issues in terms of even just a pleasure craft. I was just talking to Darren the other day and I said, what if there is a, a yacht just upstream of the water, Wallaceburg water intake that all of a sudden has diesel or whatever fuel and it's spilling right you know, within minutes of the water intake, what would you do? There is always that risk, but hopefully it's now reduced. Right. Um, and I see we are, there are still several questions that um, are coming in, which is great. This is a topic everyone is uh, very passionate about and interested in. But unfortunately, our time now is 7.33. I'm going to give each of the panelists, just a, if they want to pipe in a, a parting comment, um, now is your time to say one final comment that maybe you think is important for the group to hear, but um, didn't get a chance to say either in a response. So Vince, I can start with you. Well, I, I, thanks for the opportunity. I, what I wanna say is uh, thanks. I'm, 
I'm from uh, born and raised in Wallsburg. And as a teenager, I remember going to Zellers to, to get the water. I remember Chris being one of the teachers. Uh, she was uh, just, just young, you know, we, you know, just uh, not much older than, than me there, of course. And she was a great teacher and a great inspiration. I think that experience in Wallsburg is actually what, what got me uh, in, into the environmental science. And to be sitting here and uh, participating on this panel right now uh, with this audience and this this amount of participation and and all that's going on and, and where we're at today, it's uh, pretty surreal. And I, I just wanted to thank you for inviting me to attend and I'll do whatever I can uh, in my role to help uh, this group uh, with, with whatever you like. All right, thanks a lot. Thank you, Vince. Uh, Darren? No, obviously, um... There's been a lot of great work by Watch, by Vince's group, uh, the, the, all the industries in the Valley that's helped us. Like We haven't had a closure since 2013, which is fantastic. That makes um, me sleep better at night. Um, I usually get about 20 phone calls a year from Spills Action Center. Uh, most of the time, it's a sewage treatment plant uh, bypass, which is very easy to deal with. We don't get any... Um, big high risk issues anymore. Um, it's just fantastic work that's being done to help the environment. And also thank you to Lynn for your inspiration at the beginning. Thank you, Darren. And Chris, uh, any yeah. brief parting message? Yeah, just uh, very quickly, I would like to challenge the Ministry of the Environment to create a community right to know on spill prevention technology that is accessible to the public. Meaning that, uh, you know, watched, we did our interviews, with the industry, but that's not sustainable. Uh, the ministry has to have the right, I believe, to ask industries to dispel to the communities throughout Ontario, not just in Wallsburg. So that's my little Christmas wish. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So with that, we will, um, I, I I know I'm just wanting to respect people's times. So unfortunately, we had a late uh, we had a late start with some technical challenge, but it is 7:36. Um, I think uh, you know I'm happy to stay on. I, I can't speak for the panelists, but um, I'm happy to stay on and uh, see if we can field some more questions. But um, I know people have an evening to get to, so I wanted to convey. My thank you again to everyone who took the time out this evening to participate in this um, virtual information session. And as I said, this is going to be a series and this is the first. So we do have two more information sessions in a very similar format to tonight. Um, and it will deal with, um, you know, other beneficial use impairments, including uh, fish and wildlife populations and, and habitat. So uh, stay tuned, you will uh, receive an invitation to those future sessions because you signed up for this evening and kindly, again, watch out for those uh, follow up surveys. Uh, they will be in your email tomorrow. Um, we do take them seriously to try and improve uh, our, our sessions as we go. This is kind of a first for us, um, but we do hope you enjoyed it. And again, I want to thank panelists, uh, the participants and uh, everybody who um, participated tonight, including the organizing team. Again, it wouldn't have been possible without you. So we will be uh, kind of capturing, we've recorded this session. It will be available on the AOC website, along with all the questions, that, which were really great. Um, and we will endeavor to respond to all of them and post them uh, within a few weeks time. So on that note, um, I will sign off. And if the panelists want to stick around for uh, an extra few minutes to chat, that would be great. And thank you again, everybody, on behalf of the Canadian RAP Implementation Committee. Thank you. I can stay if there are any questions, any more questions. Okay. Okay. And was, was I doing a closing? <gasps> oh, um, thank you. <laughs> I, I can't see. Oh, maybe with the panelists, Lynn, that would be great. I, I wasn't yeah. sure. I, I knew uh, we were having some time issues. Let's just see. I am still having some issues. Where's my technical? Hey, technical team. <laughs> there, April, what, what, what do you need? Oh, there you are. Um, so can you see as everybody signed off, Lynn is available to do a closing, but I think people have hung up, but I thought maybe if the um, panelists are around, we can, we can 
um, spend a few minutes. Yeah. Says there's still 38 people on the call. Oh, yeah, well, there's still great. lots of people, so we can all enjoy the closing. Okay, that's great. <laughs> Thanks so much. Yeah. Um, so I first of all, I'd just like to say I, once again, um, miigwech for uh, inviting me to participate in this evening. I, um, I enjoyed hearing the little uh, presentations on some of the uh, technical um, data and, and the work that's being done in the background. Uh, Chris, I enjoyed hearing about WATCH. Um, if it weren't for groups like, like yourself and, and the people who are working and involved in that, um, you know, it, it's, it's just uh, amazing how much can be accomplished when a group come together collectively. You know, when there's a common um, denominator, so to speak, to, to um, bring things to action. And, you know, I know that, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the time that we live in today, you know, we, we're surrounded by technology and, you know, it's supposed to be, I guess, the thing, the thing to do, right? Um, you know, when our ancestors lived all those years ago, they didn't have all the luxuries that we have today. And to be quite honest, um, I don't know if any of us could survive, you know, as our ancestors did, because, you know, we've all become so accustomed to, to the world that we live in today, right? Um, however, when we think about those things, you know, the one thing that I'm, I'm always mindful of, and more so I think as, I, as I'm growing older, um, is ensuring that our younger generation is informed of um, everything that's taking place. So, you know, I had posed one of the questions there, you know, about federal and uh, provincial and federal regulations, right? Um, if, if, if there were an, enough people, if there were enough people that would step forward and sound their voice, um, the politicians have to pay attention, right? They have to pay attention when there's more voices at the table to in, in either opposition or requesting more supports for, for the implementation, implementation of stronger regulations. You know, um, and the other thing I wanted to mention was, you know, yes, uh, I was, you know, I was born here in, in this territory. Um, I was here in my very, very young life and then my father took us away. So, um, but I, I still remember seeing the changes whenever we would come home to visit. I could see the changes in the landscape of the growing, you know, the growing industry around us. And now, you know, what I see is when an industry or when, when a local industry um, fulfills its whatever obligation or meets, you know, it's life, you know, and now, you know, I think about the dog chemical lands, you know, they're not there no more. But what did they leave behind? Hey, you know, I remember I was talking to my sister just the other day. And I said, I remember being a child, um, a young person, and them burying barrels and barrels and barrels of, of stuff, you know, off a of LaSalle line, and it's still there. It's probably still there under the earth, eh? Um, and I remember them putting them in there. And I think how, I wonder how those barrels are holding up because there were no liners in there. It was just the dirt, right? They dug a big hole in the dirt in the earth, started stacking those barrels in there, and it was all coming from Dow Chemical. So what are going to be the repercussions for our community and for the other surrounding communities, you know, all the people who live in this area? So, you know, those kinds of things are going to, you know, something's going to happen someday. I'm, I'm not looking to be a doomsday person here, but that's the reality of things, right? 
so how can, and I just wanted to leave this thought with everybody. So how can we effectively engage with our young people and give them the information that they're gonna need to take forward with them, okay? What can, what knowledge can we, you know, instill in them? You know, so the one thing that I'm doing, and you know, and I talk about spirituality and I talk about, you know, I, I uh, immersed myself in ceremony for many, many years to learn and learn and learn and learn because, I mean, I, I was brought up by my father and, you know, we hunted, we fished, we, you know, I know how to go on the land and look for food, um, you know, all those things that grow in the seasons. Um, but what if they're not there anymore, you know, and, you know, a lot of this, the surrounding industry of Amjunang, the people of today had no say. And, and, and I believe that even my ancestors who came from this land, this part of the land, they really didn't have a say in, no, we don't want that here. No, we'll put it someplace else. You know, but when, but when we stand up today together, you know, they didn't put the ethanol plant here like they were going to. It's just down the ways a little bit. But they're still taking that water, eh? All these industry around us are still taking that water from the from the river. You know, um, and so how do we ensure that they are putting it back in a good way, right? Um, so I implore to uh, you know, all the women on the on the call, stand up and do your work. Be the voice of the water learn about the spirit and the spiritual connection to Nebe. You know, even, even our men folk, you grew in your mother's womb in that very sacred place in that, in, in that water, right? You know, and, and it flows all through us. What are we like 70% water or something like that? Maybe more, right? As, as human beings. And so just be mindful of, of your thoughts and, and how you talk, um, because what we put out there and, you know, in our, in our energy and what we call into our and what we put inside ourselves, it's reflective of how we walk. And these are just things that I've learned through life. So if we all learn to walk a little bit more gentler and treat each other with a little bit of love and kindness, you know, and really be mindful of our surroundings and creation, you know, maybe we can make this world a little bit better place to live. So I can go on and on, but I won't. Um, I wanted just to say that much um, because I'm really, 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 um, I, I, I just, it's so hard to describe the spiritual connection to the land and to the water, and to the earth, and to the air. You know, it went, once we start embracing those things, it's only going to get better for each and every one of us. So I say miigwech um, to each and every one of you, and I've been on my computer all day <laughs> with work and everything, so I am going to sign off after um, my close out, but once again miigwech for, for listening, and for being present, right? And for being present and, and, and opening your mind and opening your heart. So I'll say, Ahau, miigwech, pomapi minwa, wabmin. Ahau.